Good evening, everybody out there. Good evening, good evening. Okay. All right. We're building up to a big Wednesday. That we are. Good to see you guys this, this evening. Let me pull you guys back up again. You know, I don't know why. They wait. I, some things are hard to believe. You know, I purposely waited a few more minutes, right, to see if uh, any weird happenings would take place. Nothing happened just now. I was getting uh, on air. An update came through, or trying to come through. But it's on an isolated uh, system now, so they can't really get through like that. Can you believe that? Can you all believe that? Never fails. Never fails. Just never fails. Well, it's good to see you guys. I hope you guys are doing okay. Do you all know tonight's uh, title? The broadcast title? Anybody? Anybody look at the uh, homepage to see the broadcast title? Very important title, actually. Very important conversation. Given the gravity of... Uh, I, I know people are... You know, they're, they're parading these uh, ideas of peace and everything else. But, but, we live in a very, uh, very spontaneously explosive time. We do. We do. Especially since uh, this morning, anyway. This morning, there was talk of another attempt already. Talk of another attempt. So we know that... Uh, you know, things in the background are still boiling. And the earth is actually shifting quite a bit. Um, wow. Tonight's title, Tuesday, right? Restoration before the return. Anybody know what that means? Restoration. We're talking about a full restoration, an absolute restoration. Right? We're not talking about wishful thinking. Right? This isn't a, some sort of rhetorical conversation. There are no rhetorical devices in this conversation. No. We're talking about the intent of the father to have all of his children absolutely, absolutely restored prior to his return. In fact, some people forget about, forget this one fact. All too often, we uh, we say to ourselves, you know, we throw caution to the wind sometimes. We say, well, you know, the Lord's going to, he's going to do, he's going to prepare me before he comes back. Now, the Bible says he's going to present to himself a glorious church without spot or wrinkle. Do you guys know that? He's going to present to himself a church without spot or wrinkle. So he is going to do the work. What part do you play? Here it comes. The Lord works in the realm of truth. Absolute truth, right? If a person is not fully dedicated, and what I mean by that is if you don't have your mind set, on your Lord, right? How can you belong to him at that time of restoration? The Lord is faithful. He will do exactly what he said he would do. He will finish the work he began in you, but you must be his. And so there's a qualification of those who actually belong to him and those who don't. Right? And sometimes, sometimes we hamper ourselves. Let's go ahead and face it. We are spoiled. We are. Many things have been removed from this earth. We've been separated from the horrors of the past. We're not living in the time of Noah when there were Nephilim in the earth all over the place. Right? Uh, not, not like he was. We don't live in the time where all these discovered bones of these giant creatures are roaming around. We don't live in that time. Well, we didn't for a long time. We've had relative peace. 
We fought each other, yes. We complicate issues, yes. We compete. We tear down each other at times, yes. But we've had relative peace. In the end times, we know many things will take place. But are we genuine in our pursuit of Christ? Or do we make excuses for ourselves? Right? By the way, an excuse is something that you give when you have to do something. That's what an excuse is. An excuse is not something you give when you're not, you know, obligated to do something. Take note of that. Take note, right? If I don't have to do something, don't give an excuse. An excuse is when you absolutely have to do something, right? Now, the one thing that the Lord mandates of us is that we love the Lord our God with all of what we are. And in that one factor, sometimes we fail, right? Sometimes we're not there because we are a bit spoiled. We are. We are. We have not, we, we have it made right now, believe it or not, right? When we compare ourselves to other people, we can find ourselves lacking. But in truth, we're not lacking. We're not. We're not starving to death. Have you guys seen these other countries? Right? Some of these, uh, well, it's hardly any left now. Even Africa is changing abruptly. Do you guys know that? What we enjoyed in the 80s, right? They're enjoying right now. Everything is changing for them. But we have had such a time of freedom. We really have. We really have. Especially in, in our generation, we have. We didn't go through the Great Depression. Right? That happened before us. In fact, we didn't go through quite a few things. Right? We, we fuss, we fight a lot which normally happens when people are bored, when people have plenty. They can afford to do that. It's the issues that we argue about that lets us know we've been spoiled. right? Because we argue about the silliest issues. See, uh, um, if you have a people, they're really striving to survive. They do not argue over how somebody looks, what they say, right? how they mispronounce things. Um, what their viewpoint is, uh, given certain items, they don't do that. They don't. They're so focused on food. There are large fights over food, contentions over who's going to live and who's going to die, real grievances because they don't have enough to go around, right? So they have to, loved ones have to really sort out who's going to get nutrition, who won't. Those times used to be. Can you imagine being in a family and somebody in that family has to make a decision who's going to get the nourishment and who will not? We don't do that these days. We get picky over what we eat. Then we start nitpicking at that. Spoiled. But the Lord told us all of that would change. Right before it changes, he would give us an opportunity to be shielded, to be built up, to be prepared, to be fortified, right? We know that there's going to be a spiritual unleashing all across the face of the earth. That's something we often take lightly because we're not a society, we're not a people. This is not the generation that's been immersed in, these, in a spiritual release of these negative entities, right? We hear about them here and there. Never all at one time. We don't, right? And, 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 and we, we have been shielded. We have a hedge around us. We do. Nobody has, uh, is, is scared to go outside because they're frightened of some manifested thing coming to get them. We don't live in those days. Right? We have lots of freedoms. And in our freedoms, what have we done? In this time of relative plenty, what have we done? In truth, what have we done? We know we murmured 
we know we complained. We know that of the obligation of loving the Lord with all of what we are, we had split interests. We know we came up with reasons not to love our neighbor as ourselves. We know this, and a time of correction has come, which, by the way, is a blessing. See, because if God doesn't give us a time of correction, it's kind of like what happened a couple of days ago, right? Do you guys know that that attempt has altered? It has altered so much within that person. Do you know that? I mean, it's altered everything. If you guys would hear some of the conversations, some of the uh, some of the comments being made, people telling everybody to tone everything down, they're not going to tolerate certain things anymore. It has altered the core of that person. That attempt, right? In this person's own words, you know what they said? They said, They shouldn't be alive, and they're not going to waste the opportunity of being alive. That God was merciful. Hmm? This person admitted who they were, and they were astounded. God would be so gracious. That person admitted They were astounded God would be so gracious. A real change has been handed to this individual. The whole world saw it. Now, do you guys think that just happened for his sake or yours? Huh? Do you think that just happened for his sake or for the whole world's? Here's what I personally think. When things like that happen, it's for everybody who knows about it. Everybody who saw it. Everyone who engaged, not just that one person, but everybody else. A close call, a very close call. It's almost like that bus story, right? You never know what you've been protected from. But if you could see the hidden things that God disallows, the small things, he maneuvers to keep you out of harm's way. That bullet, what what made him look up at that, uh, look up at that chart? He just looked up at that chart. Something made him look up at that chart, and he froze in that position, and boom, it happened. Now, despite conspiracy theories, I think that was for the world, right? I think that spoke a truth to the entire world. Here's what I believe. The Lord was showing us that he has been intervening. And for the most part, many have been wasting. The fact that he has been intervening, many have been wasting that type of grace. Many have not been acknowledging his goodness in their own lives. They have not. We've just not been doing it. We can look in our own lives. We know we have too many complaints on the inside. We do. Too many complaints on the inside. Too many. That was a message for the world. That was to show us that there have been some close calls, that we've been protected. We've been nicked a couple times, yes, but not destroyed. See, because if any of us are destroyed, there are no do-overs. When your life is done here on this earth, you can't come back and fix anything. You can't. And when you start to think about that, Every day becomes new. I told you guys before in my life, every everything is new. Nothing gets old. Nothing. It's, a, it's not so good for some things. But everybody is brand new to me because I don't perceive time like most. I just don't do it. Right? I don't do it. 
mean, you're looking at a person who can literally operate in one room for months without a complaint. Who doesn't need to go outside? I don't need a vacation. I don't need those things. All I need is to accomplish what the Lord has given me to accomplish. All the rest of that stuff is just, is extras. It has no bearing on my life. It's not what my life is about. See, a lot of people, they have adopted the culture of this world to the point where they cannot be content with what the Lord has given them. You know what the Bible, when it says, when the Lord was addressing his people, and he said, everyone loves covetousness. You remember that? In the book of Jeremiah, when he was describing the inhabitants of the people, Everyone, um, he, he said, everyone has given in to covetousness. Covetousness is when everybody wants something that somebody else has. Now, we have a culture based on covetousness. A salesman, and don't feel bad if you're a salesman, right? Nobody was born perfect, kind of like uh, many of us were not born uh, in, in the Holy Land, right? So no one can expect us to hold that, to have that culture. We're adopted into the branch, and we operate based on mercy. At any rate, a salesman will go out and create a desire in a person they never had before. That person then says, oh, yeah, I need that. So they create needs where there isn't. No one needs a $2,000 vacuum cleaner. No one needs, right, a 60-inch television. We don't need those things. But we're given into covetousness. See, the Lord was describing this world we live in today. He said the priests were light, doing harm to his people, saying peace, when he has spoken no peace. And to this day, Has Israel had peace? God has not declared peace over Israel. He declared his process over Israel. Do you know that? I'm going to show you guys something in the Bible where the Lord said, right? Given certain times. Remember when he said that that statement, pray for the peace of Israel. Have you guys looked at that in context? Have you looked at that? Have you actually looked at that? To see what God was talking about. Not what people said, but what the Lord was talking about. Hmm? You know, it's just like telling a family that's in the middle of a war. Right? Say, say there was a war in America. And outside your home is a great war. Right? But your family is encouraged to be at peace with one to another. Hear me on this, so that you could be a strong unit in that war, so that you could be resilient in that war. See, when you're facing negative times, a family bond is everything. If you go back and read those scriptures again, and you keep them in their context, you're going to find out the Lord was encouraging them to encourage the family that it may be strong during the declared difficult times. Because even in the book of Daniel, it said wars and desolations are determined until the end. But the Lord wanted those in that place to love each other, to hold each other up, not to tear each other down, not to let the woes of war and of conflict and of all these declarations God put upon that land to start having them tear down each other. Do you know that? It's a beautiful thing when you read it. See, God doesn't speak in contradictory ways. He does not speak in contradiction. In the book of Ezekiel, God was not happy with those who spoke a message of peace. He said, peace, peace, I've spoken no peace. He said, these people are speaking out of their own spirits. I didn't tell them to say that. 
They are weakening my people, having them look for peace, and only war comes. That's what the living God said. That's why there's a breakaway happening. A refinement is happening in the body of Christ. You know how they have popular sayings that everybody used to love? People are getting away from those popular sayings. People are starting to look into the word of God and some people with confusion. Because they'll ask, I'm often asked, Mike, why does this say this? I was taught this all my life. And that's not what this says. I just tell them to keep going. Because sometimes, well, most often, when something comes through the grapevine, it's often shaped right, for the benefit of the one speaking. Because the word of God will not speak towards the benefit of mankind. If anybody ever read the word of God context, it would tear down this entire system that we have in the world. All these ideologies we think are okay, you'd find that the Lord stands against them because they weaken the faith and the spirit of people. They encourage all those things the Lord says stay away from, like covetousness, eh? like drunkenness, not being sober, like adultery. The world comforts a person in those things. Like right now, how many people talk about marriage? Not too many. Aren't people content just living with the other person without the, uh, you know, uh, obligation, without that commitment hmm? of being one flesh, in truth, taking on that responsibility? People have redefined their lives just like God said they would. In fact, people are doing exactly what God said they would. They're calling good evil and evil good. They're speaking out of their own spirits. Many make forecasts for their own benefit. Correct? That's what they do. And a change is coming. And before that change comes, the Lord opens up this, um, this place, this window of time, that every single last believer can get themselves prepared in truth, right? That they can get themselves in position. That they can have restoration before he comes. Because the Father told us he's not coming back for everybody. He's not. In fact, there are statements that they allude to in the Bible that those you think will make it won't and those you think won't make it will. Have you guys heard the speech of the apostles in the New Testament? When they made reference to the Old Testament, even Jesus did the same thing. Remember when the Pharisees were loyal to Moses and Abraham? What did Jesus refer to Moses and Abraham as? What, what did he say the Pharisees made those people? Their gods, didn't he? Hmm? People made those things of old, their gods. Yet again, man, flesh worshipers is what they just want to have a person they can worship. And the Lord is totally against that. He didn't bring anybody to the forefront to be worshipped. The Pharisees, he, he, in fact, Jesus said, God can make these rocks children of Abraham. Remember, they kept saying, oh, we're children of Abraham. You know, we're the original people. We have a right. Everybody running around say they have a right. They have a right. They have a right. They have a right. What they deserve. You know what the truth is? We deserve death. But through God's love and mercy, we have life. We don't deserve freedom. We don't. Because in our time of ignorance, outside 
of the salvation of Christ, we too did violence to the law. Without Christ, we are evildoers. We are. In the Bible, it says you'll know a tree by its fruit. Well, we produced some pretty rotten fruit from time to time in our lives and blamed it on somebody else. We adopted the philosophy of the world to make a target of people to always have somebody we don't like. The Lord is giving a window to break all those things so that we can really hear his word, not man's interpretation of his word, but his word. You know that word that says, love your enemy? Yet that small thing people still can't do. It's amazing to me how you saw that precise thing, right, during the uh, convention on these news channels where I've been watching what they're doing. Do you not know that NBC pulled certain shows that would speak anything negative against Trump? How about that? They pulled those shows. For all of you out there who don't like, you don't like Donald Trump, right? Say you don't like him. Let me ask you something. Do you know it? For all those that do like Donald Trump, let me ask you something. Do you know him? Get to know him, right? You know of things that other people have said, but the truth is, you may not know him. So let me ask you this. How can we criticize? How can we lift up what we don't know? How can we do that? Because, see, we're forming our opinion based on what? based on the view and the statements of others. Let's go ahead and tell that truth. Based on the view and statement of others. In other words, through the grapevine, we've made a decision. We don't know personally, do we? We don't. That's how this world works, right? That's how it works. There are people out there that cannot stand me. They can't stand me. But they all say the same thing. And there are some people out there that seem to like me to pieces, right? Based on what, though? What's it based on? Based on what they've heard. Now, you guys know me a lot better than you did. But there are many who have not listened to me. But they've already formed an opinion, either for or against. My point is, they did so through the words of somebody else. They have no personal knowledge of me. And when you have no personal knowledge of a person, what you're doing is believing the story of somebody else 100% that you would actually go and judge a person based off, based off the information of another. Anybody think that's dangerous? Can you imagine the most time if we could see right into the realm of truth, imagine this, those of you who don't like Trump, if the Most High had his hand on Donald Trump right now, and you don't like him, so that means you're standing against what the Lord has his heart toward. Oops. About those who don't like Biden. Suppose the Lord God has his hand upon Biden. You know, like he did us in the middle of our sin. You know how he did us when we were doing all this worldly stuff that was detestable in the nostrils of the living God, when our sins stunk to the highest heavens, how the Most High had his hands upon us. And then somebody would say, I don't like that person. Yet the Father said, I love that person. Uh-oh. You don't think that person's going to pay for it if they stay in that mode? You better believe they're going to pay for it because they stand against what the Most High loves. And if I'm not mistaken, there are plenty of warnings in the Bible about people like that, how they honor him, 
with their mouths, but their hearts are far from him. Oops. Oops. Because see, if you hate something the Lord loves, your heart is far from him. Oops. Isn't that that's an oops moment? Right? If God loves something, but you hate it, your heart is not with the living God. Think about that. Let, let that sink in for a moment. See, because that puts us back into this position where we say, well, wait a minute. I just, I need to obey the Lord and not emulate the world going forward. I've got to make a choice. And all of you know that spiritually. How many people in the last week had that thought on their mind? I've got to make a choice. Huh? How many? How many people said that? I've got to make a choice. Somebody yesterday was talking about Joe Biden. And they said, yeah, he needs that stuff from babies. So, oh boy, that QAnon stuff again. They're still trying to justify QAnon. It's a, that's no good, is it? That's what they're doing. Still trying to justify QAnon. And for what reason? To what end? So they can build up some sort of hatred in the minds of others. So you can hate somebody in the world. And you will not step foot into the kingdom of the living God that way. You will not. In fact, if you have not forget, if you hate someone on this earth, God sees you as a murderer only. Do you know that? You're a murderer. And no murderer will step foot into the kingdom of God. Just like no adulterer will step foot into the kingdom of God. Just like no liar will step foot into the kingdom of God. I'll say it again. This is that window. This is the window of time. This is that moment the Lord gives. That we can be restored prior to the unfolding of the inevitable, of the ancient things. Right now in the world, there's nothing ancient roaming around, is it? This is not going to last. It will not. It's been foretold too many times. Hmm? Hmm? Too many times. But all this stuff that we see, everything that we know, it's going to fall apart right in front of our faces. Let me ask you guys something. What if the Lord said, no, he's not going to forgive you? Would that be devastating? What if the Lord said that to us, that he would not forgive us? So let me put this on your mind. If any of you continue to have this place in your heart where you really cannot forgive someone, your father in heaven won't forgive you. Somebody said, Mike, this satanic Stuff has to stop. It sure does. But see, here's the problem. Name one person who was never involved in satanic operations that the world knows. Somebody name one person. Name one person who was not involved in satanic things. Please name one person. Just one. Just name one. Hmm? Name one person. Of course, and it will go, but it's going to build. Listen to me. It's going to build up 
No, you guys know what I mean. We're not talking about Christ. We won't defile him that way. I said, name one person who has not been involved in satanic things. Jesus is not a person. He's our Lord and Savior. You name one person who's not been involved in this satanic junk of this world. One. Name one. Name one. We're not talking about ministers. Uh -uh, because that person said this satanic stuff has to stop. Name one person outside of ministry who's not been involved in this satanic stuff. Go ahead. You can't. It's not, it's not a very safe bet to name anybody in our time. Name one person in politics who's not been involved in this satanic stuff. You can't name anybody because all of them have had their hands in it. All of them. All of them have. So what makes a person, what makes a person who did it 20 years ago different from a person who did it 10 years ago? There's no difference. You know what the difference is? Huh? The grace and mercy that Jesus will bestow upon someone so their souls can be saved. Because every single last one of us is sinners saved by grace. Have any of you been involved in witchcraft? Yes or no? I tell you unknowingly you have. You most certainly have been unknowingly. You didn't even know it. Doesn't matter who you are. It does not matter who you are. You know what witchcraft is? Witchcraft is a process of manipulation. It's how you manipulate a person. For example, let me give you one, one basis of witchcraft. Creating a desire within a person that never existed before. That's witchcraft. Like when you needed that iPhone. Or when you needed, when you, when you drooled for a computer or something like that, or ice cream, you were manipulated into believing that you actually needed something. And how many of you got angry at someone, right? Because you could not get what you had a strong desire for, but the truth was you really did not need it. I'm telling you, everybody has been touched by that satanic crap. And it's only by Christ that it will ever be broken. We cannot break it. We can only agree that Jesus is our Savior. He will break it. We can't break it. We can make a decision toward the Lord. See, people normally pick out the big things and they forgot about the small things. It's easy to point to the sin of somebody over there after you're saved. But, and have their sins announced. How many of you would stand in front of the world and announce your sin, your dirty laundry before the world? You, do you see what's happening? The world calls out. They find out something on somebody. They put it before the world and say, hey, we found out this person did so and so. Then you have a bunch of people who come up and say, well, that's shame on that person. Yeah, but what about your dirt? What about your dirt that Jesus knows? Huh? What if he were to stand before the world and announce your dirt? You'd be in the same boat as that person you blame. Jesus had already told us. He told us things for a reason. He tells us to love our neighbor for a reason. To love your enemy for a reason. So you won't be a hypocrite. Because not one hypocrite will step foot in the kingdom of God. And these are principles being slowly lost. I mean, it's only a remnant of these principles left. That means you can get everything else right. But if, you're, if you still have that hypocrisy internally, how can we step foot into the kingdom? When by nature we operate just like the devils in the world. 
redemption is total, which means it is God who will make us aware of these things within ourselves. If we agree to have them purged, it is the Most High who will purge them. See, when the enemy steps foot in America in great numbers, it's going to become all too real. It will. When the center of this nation cracks, and it will, it's going to crack. It's going to become all too real. When nobody has a warning, but a storm so strong will almost push down half the buildings in this nation of America, it's going to become too real. When the devastations are so much that it looks like the infrastructure will never recover, it's going to be all too real. When the crops are dead because the temperatures keep going higher and higher, it's going to become all too real. When the gas crisis comes, it's going to become all too real. When you go to the gas station and they say, no, no, we can't sell you gas. We cannot sell you gas because of the boycott. We can't do it. And when you go somewhere else, they say, nope, you can't get gas here either. Sorry. And when you find that some of these gas stations have had their tanks vacuumed and there's nothing in them, it's going to be all, it's going to be too late. It's going to be too late. But those who sought change now, I mean right now, their souls, their souls are going to be anchored in the Lord. See, because in Revelation, something was told to us that matches the New Testament, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. The Lord said, in your, in your patience, possess ye your souls, didn't he? You guys remember that? In your patience, possess ye your souls. Do you guys remember that statement? Then in Revelation, he defined it for us, didn't he? In Revelation, the Lord defined that for us, didn't he? What the patience, what, what, how, how to possess your soul that way. In your patience, possess ye your souls. That means keep your souls. You, your soul can only be kept in patience. Otherwise, you're going to lose it, right? You're not going to have the patience. If you're not fortified, if you're not totally restored before this stuff begins, you won't have it. You will not have patience. You won't have the patience to maintain yourselves. You won't. Jesus gave us a warning. A very real warning. And you know what? Many people, many people are not going to make it because of that one warning. Let me bring up this small fact to you guys. Jesus said in your patience, possess ye your souls, right? That's what he said. In your patience, possess ye your souls. That's what he said. But he said a time would come. Right? A time would come when that man of perdition is revealed. A time would come when people would lead others into captivity. Right? Because he said he said this. Speaking of the beast, and he wasn't lying, and the angel signified this, giving it to John. He said it was given unto him to make war with the saints. Who? This beast. It was given unto him to make war with the saints, Revelation 13, 7. And to overcome them. And power was given to him over all kindreds and tongues and nations. Not some, all. Then it says, if any man hath an ear, let him hear. That means those who have an ability to hear the word of the Lord then hear the word of the Lord. And those who don't want to hear the word of the Lord, it's not for you. He says, he that leadeth into captivity shall go into captivity. Now, why would this just all of a sudden, the Lord, you know, we're talking about the beast here. This is written about the beast. And all of a sudden, he snaps at this subject. He says, if you have an ear, listen. He that leadeth into captivity shall go into captivity. 
He that killeth with the sword must be killed with the sword. Here is the patience and the faith of the saints. Remember when Jesus said in your patience, possess ye your souls. That's what he said. In your patience, possess ye your souls. That's a, that's a phrase. You know, that that's a common phrase that was used back during that time. A common phrase. And Jesus used it. He used it. Huh? My goodness. Somebody said the interpretation wasn't that it was about Obama's. Huh? They represented those whose people are counting out the condemning and refusing to talk. What is that? I don't get that one. Clarify that one. Sounds interesting. Clarify. But Jesus said in your patience, possess ye your souls. He gave us a caution. The Lord gave us a caution, a big caution, actually. A caution we would do well to apply during these days. But here's the question. There's a vice for many in this world right now who would hear the caution in truth, who would take it to heart. Not the cautions we want to have because of convenience. I'm talking about those cautions that are real. See, when something is real, the world doesn't like it. When something is real and when it's with the Lord, the world does not. They do not accept it. They don't. They don't accept it. Do they? I've never seen them accept anything openly of the Lord. Never saw it. Ever saw them embrace it. I'm going to read this to you guys. You ready? And when you shall see Jerusalem compassed with armies, then know that the desolation thereof is nigh. Luke 21, 20. Then let them which are in Judea flee into the mountains. Let them which are in the midst of it depart out. And let not them that are in the countries enter there into. So in other words, those who are not in Jerusalem don't go there. Those who are in Jerusalem get out. You know that's opposite the Old Testament? Do you know that? Do you know that? Because in the Old Testament, it said that everybody who was would be found in Jerusalem would be protected. Why is Jesus saying, when you see Jerusalem compassed or surrounded with armies, then know that the desolation thereof is nigh. Why did he say, then let them which are in Judea flee into the mountains, let them which are in the midst of it depart out in Judea, and let not them that are in in the countries, enter therein too. For these be the days of vengeance, that all things which are written may be fulfilled. I like the way that's put. Did you guys hear what I said? Let those in Judea flee into the mountains. Nobody's going to say it? Huh? See, in the Old Testament, didn't it say that those who go into Jerusalem, right, that's going to be their sanctuary, correct? But here in the New Testament, it's saying, right, when you see Jerusalem surrounded by armies, know that the desolation of it is nigh. The desolation of what? Jerusalem. Know that the desolation of Jerusalem is nigh. What desolation is that? You're not going to like it. Do you guys understand what the desolation is? He said, when you see Jerusalem surrounded by armies, know that the desolation thereof is not. Because what does it say in the book of Matthew? When you shall see the abomination of desolation spoken of by the prophet Daniel. Uh Uh-oh. When you see the abomination of desolation and it's placed where it ought not be. Right? Right? Uh Uh-oh, where's it going to be placed? 
Where's the abomination of desolation going to be placed? Let me read this to you. Follow me now. You guys stay with me. You guys, I'm going. You guys want to follow me to Daniel chapter 11? Come on, let's get there. Go right now. Let me open up another doohickey here. I'm going to be there. Right. Here it is. Uh oh, there it is. There it is. When you see the abomination of desolation spoken of by the prophet Daniel, that's what it says in the book of Matthew. Now, what do we read in the book of Daniel, chapter 11? Here, let me read it to you. Daniel 11, 31. And arms shall stand on his part, and they shall pollute the sanctuary of strength, and shall take away the daily sacrifice. And they shall place the abomination that maketh desolate. That's the beast. The beast is going to set up shop right there in Jerusalem. You know, the one Paul said, that that day shall not come unless there come a falling away and that man of perdition be revealed. That one. That one. That one. And what day was he talking about? The day, the day when the saints see Christ and they join him in the air. That day is not coming lest there come a falling away and that man of perdition is revealed. Now that's what the apostle said. Hmm? So that means those who are alive at that time, they're going to see the placement of the beast in Jerusalem. No wonder it says in Luke 21, and when you shall see Jerusalem surrounded with armies, do you know why? Who are those armies? Who are those specific armies? Listen closely. Listen closely. The king of the north, right? The ships of Shittim are going to come against them. Therefore, he shall be grieved and return and have indignation or hatred, angry hatred against the holy covenant. So shall he do. He shall even return and have intelligence with them that forsake the holy covenant. So he's going to return, right? And have intelligence or information with all those nations who also forsake the Holy Covenant, listen, and then it says, and arms, weapons, armies, shall stand on his part. He will direct all the armies of combined nations against what? They collectively are going to go into Jerusalem and pollute the sanctuary of strength. That's why Jesus says, And when you shall see Jerusalem surrounded with armies, know that the desolation thereof is nigh. Why? Because in Daniel 11, 31, the collective armies that are now under full power of the beast are going to go into Jerusalem. And it's going to be a bad, bad day because that is described in the Bible where they ravaged the women. They burn up everything. They take over everything. And the Bible confirms, yes, God is going to let this happen. Why? Because it is the days of vengeance. Do you guys know what the days of vengeance are? It is the indignation of the Lord. It's the same reason. Just to further define this, in the book of Daniel, follow me on this. Follow me on this. It says, For the ships of Shittim shall come against them. Therefore he shall be grieved. This is Daniel 11, 30. He's going to be grieved. He's going to have intelligence with them that forsake the Holy Covenant. Right? And arms are going to stand on his part. They shall pollute the sanctuary of strength and shall take away the daily sacrifice. And they shall place the abomination and make it desolate. Now keep that in your mind. That was Daniel 11, 30, and 31. A group of nations that hate Israel. This is very specific. So not every, listen, we're not talking about every army out there. A group of nations that specifically hate Israel. They have indignation against the Holy Covenant. Well, guess what? If you have indignation against the Holy Covenant, 
What religion are you? What religion are you? What religion has indignation against the Holy Covenant? Come on, we're grown. We can say it. Hmm? Anybody? There you go. Islam. Islam has indignation against the Holy Covenant. Now stay with me. Islam has indignation against the Holy Covenant. It is part of their religion. Islam has indignation against the Holy Covenant. Because they don't believe Israel should be there in the first place. See, that's what Iran uses. That's what they use. Right? This is what happened in the past with King Darius and all those folks. With Babylon. Right? Because it really began with him. And then it began to mutate into something else. So this indignation against the Holy Covenant. It's satanic at its core. It's also an element that's not going to go away. Nobody's going to get rid of that problem. This event in Daniel, Daniel 11, 30 and 31 will happen. It's going to happen. Now, follow me. Notice in Daniel 31, it says, and arms shall stand on his part, and they collectively shall pollute the sanctuary of strength. And that's why Jesus said, when you shall see Jerusalem compassed with armies. Now, keep that in your mind, because I'm going into Revelation. Just keep that in your mind. I'm going to show you something else. Now, remember, we're talking about the indignation of the Lord. This is the indignation of the Lord. Now, let me read this to you. You guys follow me? Listen, listen. This is Revelation 17, verse 16. And the ten horns which thou sawest upon the beast... These shall hate the whore, and shall make her desolate and naked, and shall eat her flesh and burn her with fire. Right? Right? You guys with me? The ten horns which thou sawest upon the beast, these shall hate the whore, and shall make her desolate and naked, and shall eat her flesh and burn her with fire. Right? Now listen. For God has put it in their hearts to fulfill his will and to agree and to give their kingdom unto the beast until the words of God should be fulfilled. You know what this is about. You don't have to say it. It'll come out more and more as the world catches on. Listen, I'm, and now I'm not being arrogant. It's not that, you know, only I know this. It's, that's foolish. No. But I've stood my ground on what the Lord has shown me from the beginning. Before I ever read the word of God, somehow had an understanding of certain components in the word that have never failed. But they did not agree with the popular theory of the world, which changes all the time. The word is quite consistent. There's no contradiction in it. I know a lot of people say, well, the word contradicts itself. No, no, it doesn't. They can't, they're, these, are, these are coming from people who are attempting to comprehend the word of God strictly by academia. What does the Bible say? The word must be understood spiritually. That's what the word of God says. So you're not going to understand it no matter how many colleges you go to. You're not going to understand it by academia. You're not going to understand it by logic. It must be understood spiritually. And that means without the Holy Spirit, you're not going to have it. That's what that means. That's why with you all, something can ring true to you after you read it. And the truth will be in you. But as soon as you attempt to speak it, it's confused again. You all know what I'm talking about. The more you try to speak it, to give it away to somebody else, the more it's lost within you. You know exactly what I'm talking about. But internally, when you did not speak it, you had perfect clarity. You understood it. You had it. It was a blessing. But as soon as you tried to own it, to write it down when you had no authorization, to give it to somebody else when God did not move you to do that, it was taken away, wasn't it? You know that. What I'm telling you is this. 
You don't think Satan is behind a bunch of people attempting to decipher the word of God by academia. And the Bible says, lean not to your own understanding. So let me tell you this. If you don't get it spiritually, you just leaned unto your own understanding. Huh? If it's not coming by way of the Holy Spirit, you just leaned unto your own understanding. Now, do you all see this? I'm going to point out something. Now, you saw who this was, but here's what I want you to see. Revelation 17, 16 tells you about the ten horns that are upon the beast. These are ten kings. Hmm? These are ten kings who have received no power as if yet, but will one hour with the beast. Listen, for God hath put it in their hearts to fulfill his will. Not to fulfill the devil's will, but to fulfill his will. See, this should mess you up. For God hath put it in their hearts to fulfill his will and to agree and to give their kingdom unto the beast until the words of God should be fulfilled. So you mean to tell me God gave those ten kings the heart to give their nations over to the beast so they could do what? And arms shall stand on his part, and they shall pollute the sanctuary of strength, and shall take away the daily sacrifice, and they shall place the abomination that make it desolate. You better believe it. That's your father's doing. See, it takes a whole read of the word to understand this. You're not going to get this from reading one book of the Bible or two books of the Bible. Nope. You got to know the theme of the Bible. And I'll tell you now, until I read the entire Bible, the second time I read the entire Bible, everything, everything was so consistent. And quite, it was, it's a beautiful declaration. That the only way a person can truly understand it is if they hunger and thirst for righteousness. And they go into the word of God to see who their father is. And he will disclose to them what he's doing. Because see, once you know what your father's doing, you're no longer afraid. You're not afraid. You're not. But see, what's been happening for a long time is bits and pieces of the word have been taken so far out of context. Each story is important for the, no matter what mankind did. Yes, they took out the book of Enoch. Yes, they took out some other books. But God's declarations are still there. They're still there. And the Holy Spirit is still in operation. Oh, and by the way, God is still God. And he's still on his throne. So it doesn't matter what man does. They cannot take this word from you. Because God put this word in you. That's why when you read the Bible, you say, Amen. You're not reading something new as confirming what you already knew. But here's the problem, and you should, you should identify this. You already knew these things, but you were convinced to believe them a different way by people in the world. Come on now. Come on now. You knew it the right way the first time, but people convinced you to believe it their way. That's why when you read the word by yourself, you say, oh, I knew it. I should have stayed with what the Lord gave me in the first place. You cannot say amen to anything unless that truth be in you first. You must be able, you must be able to recognize the truth in order to say amen. You know what that means? You had the truth first before anybody spoke it to you. And when you heard it, you identified it and you said, amen. Before you, before you can engage or hear the words of a person who speaks English, you must first know English. That's what's meant by 
having ears to hear. Those with spiritual confirmation internally have ears to hear. And everybody cannot hear. Everybody is not of the fold. They're not. Some people have absolutely no, no confirmation of this truth within them. All right. Robin says break. We're going to take a break. And if you, I'm going to come back. We, we have so much more to come out. I'm going to come right back. Just a few minutes right here at the Council of Time. I'll be right back. Hey, everybody. Uh-oh. Okay, we're back. We, we are back. We are back. Okay, everybody with me so far? You guys good to go? You good to go? Briefly. You guys are still adding names to that prayer list. Can you guys have that ready by uh, Friday? Can you do that by Friday, please? It would be an excellent time for that. Have that ready by Friday. I'm looking forward to the Lord doing the work. I'm in absolute full restoration. I myself, I cannot promise you. Yeah, I can't promise anybody anything, but I can tell you what the Lord said. I can tell you exactly what he said. And what I expect is exactly what he declared. Hmm? Exactly what he declared. I got that flash. Somebody in uh, Mixler said they were adding names. And they're adding names to it. Adding names. Sister Mayor says there's been those who have been asking for prayers before. And I can do that with you guys together i sure can i do it by myself anyway i can do it with you guys no problem no problem before before this broadcast before any broadcast do you guys know i'm praying the lord's prayer and then i have my special interactions i'll tell you because the word makes me nervous do you guys know that the word is a holy word it makes me nervous it does you this holy word this holy word of god Makes me nervous. Do you know why? It's almost like handling explosives, right? That nobody will ever come back from. I do not want to mess it up. I really don't. I don't want to mess it up. And that makes me nervous. And when people say, you know, Mike, you had, you had that. There's certain folks out there that take the uh, statistics for COT and they'll say, Mike, you had this many people listening to you. I, I tell you, the higher the number, the more nervous I get. I am I am just so good with the small audience, right? With that small audience. Now, too many people. Do you know what that means? If I mess up, look how many people I mess up out there. That's always, that's always on my mind. And after every single broadcast, I'm very close to weeping. Because it, it, there's this, there's always this internal component that scares me to pieces. I don't know if I mess it up bad or not, right? I don't know. It makes me nervous. I don't know if it's making a difference. When people come back, right, You, no one is promised to see the fruit, right, to see the, 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 the good of their labors. No one is promised. So I'm not, I don't look for, any change immediately, right? But it is comforting to know when people say, you know, I'm reading the Bible more because of your talks. That helps me a whole lot. Oh, it does. Because it feels like, honestly, it feels like you're doing nothing. It feels like you've done absolutely nothing after a talk. It really does. Anyway, this is a holy word. It really is a holy word. It makes me nervous. Very nervous. Folks, okay, folks, you do have this right. So back to our conversation, right? Because right before the Lord returns, 
It's working on the restoration of its people. On you, on me, right? He's working on us, getting us in position. If he comes back and we're not in position, we don't go with him. We don't go with him. Think about the time in your life, right? When you, that day, you really did not look into the word of God and ask yourself something. Were you really thinking about your Lord and Savior? Can you guys imagine the Lord coming back and we're not thinking about the Lord when he comes? How disrespectful would that be? That would be like you coming home and there's supposed to be a party, right? But no one did anything for the party. Hmm? The big moment of Jesus returning, it shakes people up. People want to know dates, right? And I'm so glad the Lord did not give us a date. I'm so glad he didn't. I'm so glad that everybody who thought they were right in the past, they have been wrong. I'm so glad. Here's why. If I were to tell, let's just say, say we had uh, five of us guys lived in the the same house, right? And I was planning a trip for everybody. And I told the guys, I said, listen, a month from now, we're going on a trip. So make sure you're ready for that. And everybody says, okay. And they go to sleep. They sleep comfortable, right? In fact, they sleep comfortable up until three or four days before the trip. And then three or four days before the trip, guess what they do? They all wake up and they begin to say, I think I need this for the trip and that and this and that. So they're very busy to the day they get in the car, right? It's kind of like getting your family ready to go somewhere. You know how you, everybody's looking for everything in a hurry because you told them you have to be some, you, you, you're going to be at a certain location. So if you put a date on it, here's the problem. You could tell everybody, hey, we're going on vacation next month. Everybody says, okay. And they do nothing about it that day. Nothing. They do nothing about it the next day. They wait until about three days prior to the trip. And they try to do everything then. But they didn't do anything prior to that time. Right? They didn't. Now, that may be okay for a trip. That's not okay for your salvation. Because if we knew the exact date, we would be out in the world doing worse than we are right now because we would say to ourselves, well, I've got plenty of time to get this right. I got the date now. So when this date comes around, I'll go sell everything I have and then, but I can't do it right now because I want to live in the world and have and relax a little bit. Isn't that how we do? People want dates so they can do what they want to do up until that, you know, time where they absolutely must do things. Because if the date were 20 years from now, people would just, they'd be in the world doing everything. Because the Lord gave no dates and nobody knows when he's coming. We get put in a watch status. And what that means is to when Jesus said to watch, right? And you have to take note. There are two watches or two different types of instruction with watching. When Jesus said, watch and pray always, right? When he said, watch and pray always, he, he, he said for us to be in a certain mindset of a certain heart, of a certain lifestyle until he returns. If you're watching, Now, what are we watching for at the Lord's return? We're not watching, in this case, we're not watching for the enemy. We're watching for the Lord's return. This is very important. If you're watching for the Lord's return, you know what that means? That means you're prepared right now to go. Listen to me. Let me me go into Matthew real quick because I hope you guys get this. Because a lot of people don't. There are two types, or three types, I'm sorry, of watches spoken about in the Word of God. All throughout the Word of God, you know what? And, and, and again, in context, you can pick this up. They're not all the same. They're not. In Matthew, I'm going to go to Matthew. Let me go to Matthew real quick. I'm going to go to Matthew real quick. And uh, I'm going to read this to you guys, okay? 
it says this. I'm going to start with this one. It says, um, uh, it says, now learn the parable of the fig tree. When the branch is yet tender and put forth leaves, you know that summer is near. So when the tree, when the fig tree, you know, when the branch is tender, flexible, and, and, it's, and the buds are starting to come out, you know that summer's close. He says, so likewise, when you shall see all these things, know that it is near even at the doors. Verily, I say unto you, this generation shall not pass till all things be fulfilled. What generation? That generation that buds, that generation that's tender, just like that fig tree. That generation shall not pass till all things be fulfilled. That's you, by the way, because things were budding when we were born, right? It says, heaven and earth shall pass away, but my word shall not pass away. It said, but of the day or hour, no man knoweth. No, not the angels in heaven, but my father only. I love that one. Thank you, Lord, for that. Thank you, Lord. I love that one. It says, but as the days of Noah were, so shall also the coming of the Son of Man be. So, first of all, no man knows, no angel knows, not even Jesus knows the day nor the hour. Thank you, Lord, for that. They don't know. They don't know. Let me continue. For as the days that were before the flood, when they were eating and drinking, marrying, giving into marriage, until the day that Noah entered into the ark, and who not until the flood came, and then took them all away, so shall also the coming of the Son of Man be. They'll be unaware until that day comes upon them. Then shall two be in the field, one shall be taken, the other left. Remember, they're going. Nobody will know. So, so I hear a lot of people say, "Oh, yes, see, that's when, that's when uh, you know you're raptured out." Want to be taking the other left, right? That's when you're raptured out. That's what people say, right? It doesn't matter because you're not going to know because a lot of people, they want to be raptured out right now, which means they're unwilling to do the will of God in this day wholeheartedly because they want to leave. Their heart is not in doing the work of the living God. The work is in leaving everything behind. Oops, that is not the heart to have. I'm going to sh- Jesus said that's not the heart to have, and I will show you this in a minute. Listen, he said, two women shall be grinding at the mill, one shall be taken, the other left. He said, watch, therefore. Now, he emphasizes right after. He says, one will be grinding at the mill, one will be taking the other left, right? Two will be in the field, one will be taking the other left. He said, watch, therefore, for you know not what hour your Lord doth come. He was giving us an example. Just like a person will be snatched out from your family, snatched out from your life, from their duties here on earth, right? He said, watch, therefore, because you don't know. You don't know. Watch, therefore, for you know not what hour your Lord doth come. You don't know. I've heard people trying to say the contrary. I'm sorry, it does not work. And let me, let me continue. He says, therefore, be also ready for in such an hour as you think not the son of man cometh for in an hour, you think not the son of man cometh. Now, everybody thinks about holy days, don't they? They do. They said, well, Jesus must come on this holy day. Wait a minute. He just said, he just said in an hour, you think not. So it's not the time we're thinking of. It's not the obvious moment that he'll be sent. As with all things. See, that's how the Pharisees, they, they, how can they have messed up the greatest time in human history? When the Messiah came the first time, they messed it all up. They got it wrong. They say, you're not the Messiah. That's what they said to Jesus. Listen to me. How could the smartest people dealing with the word of God mess up the prophecy of the coming of the son of God? They messed it all up. They couldn't even recognize him. And they just knew they were right. Just like people right now, they know they're right. And I'll say it again, they're wrong. To even think they're right means they're wrong. Oops. Just like last time. They're going to do exactly what they did last time. The Pharisees looked Jesus in the face and said that he was not the Messiah. They were blind as bats. Why? Because they had a narrative they believed in. They didn't believe in God. They believed in their own narrative. Do you hear me? They leaned unto their own understanding. 
They were the experts, and they demanded everybody else, right? Everybody else learn of how they interpreted everything. Well, let me tell you something. God gives by the Holy Spirit, and the Holy Spirit does not make mistakes. You still have that same foolishness in this world today, where everybody wants to believe based on brother so-and-so or sister so-and-so. Nope. You better believe based on the Holy Spirit. And when the Lord says, no one knows the day nor the hour, you don't need to even ponder that one. But he gave us a command to watch because we don't know when he's coming. He said to watch. Now watch how this is important. Let me continue to read. He said, therefore be also ready for in such an hour as you think not the son of man cometh. Who then is a faithful and wise servant whom his Lord hath made ruler over his household to give them meat and due season? Blessed is that servant whom his Lord, when he cometh, shall find so doing. Doing what? Giving meat in due season. What is giving meat in due season? It is to give meat, right, at the appropriate time. How do you give meat at the appropriate time? You can only do that by the Spirit. So blessed is that person who is operating by the Spirit, not by their own intellect, but by the truth. The truth comes by the Holy Spirit. We're not talking about the world's truth. We're not talking about academic truth. We're not talking about scientific facts. A fact is not the truth. No, we're talking about the truth, right? To give meat due season is to hear, is to receive that from the Holy Spirit who does nothing. The Holy Spirit will not give you anything in error. And everything it gives you is going to be at the absolute right season. That comes from the Holy Ghost. Let's continue. Listen. Blessed is that servant whom his Lord, when he cometh, shall find so doing. What is that person going to be doing? They're going to be giving meat in due season. They're not going to be looking around saying, oh, I wish the Lord were here. I'm coming back. I'm ready to go. No, they're going to be giving meat in due season. They're going to be engaged in the task the Lord gave them. Do you all hear me? They're not going to have their head wandering in the clouds. They're not going to be murmuring and complaining here on this earth. They're going to be doing the work of the Lord in the earth. The work he assigned to them, they will be doing. He said, blessed is the servant, blessed is that servant, whom his Lord, when he cometh, shall find so doing. Doing what? He just said, who then is that faithful and wise servant? So you got to be faithful and wise. Come on now, faithful and wise. Here we are. Who then is that faithful and wise servant whom his Lord has made ruler over his household to give them meat in due season? Blessed is that servant. Blessed is that servant whom his Lord, when he cometh, shall find so doing. He said, Verily I say unto you, that he shall make him ruler over all his goods. Hmm? Isn't it something how this statement is said, he shall make him ruler over all his goods? And, And it was also said that that person who takes care of that little tiny thing is going to be made ruler over much. Isn't that something? Isn't that something? Hmm? Isn't that something? That's one and the same. So we're not talking about the big things you do in life. We're talking about the consistent things you do in life for the Lord. That consistent work. Some of you say, well, I can't do, I can't do anything for the Lord. Did you hear what the Lord said? Hmm? The good steward takes care of those tiny things. And based on how you take care of those tiny things, God will make you ruler over much. You know what he just said right here? Verily I say unto you that he shall make him ruler over all his goods. Who? Who? The servant who when the Lord comes finds that servant giving meat in due season. It didn't say how much meat. That's not what it said. It said giving meat in due season, which is the right meat at the right time. Hmm? The right meat at the right time. The only way you can do that is by the Holy Spirit. The right meat at the right time. Do you hear me? The right meat at the right time. 
Now, let me continue. And it says, because here comes the caution. <clears throat> but and if that evil servant shall say in his heart. Now, take note. He's, he just told us what type servant he's about to talk about. He said, but and if that evil servant shall say in his heart, I find this, I find this eye opening. He didn't say if that evil person, he said if that evil servant, uh uh-oh. See, he's using this term, servant. Who then is that faithful and wise servant? Who are we talking about, believers? Uh Uh-oh, believers. A, a, A faithful and wise servant is a faithful and wise believer. So let me ask you this. Who then is it? Is that evil believer? Uh Uh-oh, the evil believer in Christ. Yes, I just said it. Who is that evil believer in Christ? Listen, Matthew 24, 48. But and if that evil servant shall say in his heart, my Lord delayeth his coming. Let me pause right there. Because that's in the heart of an evil servant. Oh, the Lord's not coming back anytime soon. That's in the heart of an evil servant. And isn't it funny how that when the heart is that way, when you think that the Lord is not coming back anytime soon, what do you begin to do? Lash out against your fellow man. Argue about scripture. Have a target in your life that you would point a finger. Huh? See, because if a person is not an evil servant, and they're receiving things by the Holy Spirit. I'm telling you right now, they have an urgent message. They, they are not thinking in their hearts, well, the Lord's going to take forever coming back. What they're doing is saying, Lord, prepare me. Make me ready for your coming. And I'm telling you today, that faithful and wise servant right now today is doing everything they can to purge themselves. They're putting nothing off for tomorrow. They're doing everything today. And should they wake up, Tomorrow, they'll do the exact same thing. But they, the evil servant, they wake up and say, oh, another day to add to the other one. And in their heart, right? In their heart, they truly believe that the Lord has delayed his coming. See, that's when you start messing up. That's when you messed yourself up. Now, that word servant, we're talking about believers in Christ. So you have faithful and wise believers in Christ and you have evil believers in Christ. My goodness. Somebody says, well, wait a minute. Isn't a believer saved? No. No. What did the Lord say? If you believe upon his name, you're going to be saved. Now to believe upon his name is to believe upon what his name stood for. To believe upon what his name stood for means you know the story and you know what he did and you fully accept what he did upon your own life. Believe upon somebody's name is to believe what that name stands for. If you do not agree with the gospel of Jesus Christ, you do not believe upon the name of Jesus. You just know of the name of Jesus. And that's a very dangerous thing. Please make sure that's qualified in your life. Please. Please. So I'll say it again. The evil servant is the one that says, my Lord. Now listen to this. It says, but and if that evil servant shall say in his heart, listen, ready? My Lord delayeth this coming. Did you hear that? They're saying to themselves, my Lord, Jesus of Nazareth has delayed his coming. Did you hear that? Come on now, somebody. Does your Bible read the same in Matthew 24, 48? This evil servant said in their heart, my Lord delayeth his coming. He didn't say somebody else's Lord. He said, my Lord. And, and that means when, you, when a person is sitting up there and they honestly believe and they sit up and they say, well, Jesus has delayed his coming. Uh, oh, I just, uh, I just want to just, they start doing evil things. They start, they start giving in to things in this world. Huh? We know it's all true. We know that in our hearts, when we gave it serious thought, when we think the Lord's going to take a long time, we are what? 
automatically tired. We're tired. Oh, I'm so tired. And then how righteous are we when we're tired? We're not too righteous at all, are we? We're not too righteous at all. Oh, you might want to hear the rest of this. But and if that evil servant shall say in his heart, my Lord delays his coming and shall begin to smite his fellow servants and eat and drink with the drunkard. That's when you throw caution to the wind and you start doing worldly things. To smite your fellow servant is an argument. Even having ill will in your hearts towards another. To be angry at somebody else for a foolish reason or something like that. Hmm? Listen, listen. The Lord of that servant shall come in a day when he looketh not for him in an hour that he is not aware of and shall cut him asunder and appoint him his portion with the hypocrites. There shall be weeping and gnashing of teeth. That's why when people say I'm tired, I do everything I can to fight that because if a person says I'm tired, they're actually saying in their hearts, it's taken a long time for the Lord to come back, which means they're not engaged. Their mind is, they're drifting, and they, it, you, no one should drift. It's not healthy. It's not healthy. See, because if we believe in Jesus for real, there's no way in the world we would ever drift in the first place. If we trust him, we know he's coming back, and we know it takes a lifetime to get ready. It's not like a trip going to Disneyland. No. You have just enough time on this earth to get ready. Do you know that? You have just enough time. Now let me ask you this. How much time have we wasted already? Because God gives us the day that we have. It's another opportunity. Do you hear me? It's another opportunity. Every day we have is another opportunity. But if you're saying to yourself, I am tired, it's time to face the truth. We want the world and things to work out in our lives a very specific way. And when it does not, we're ready to give in. We don't like it. We throw a tantrum, whatever the case. It's time for us to admit we're not controlling life here. Life should not work out according to what we want, but we should have an understanding that we're in the process of being fully redeemed. That's why the Lord said, he that endures until the end, the same shall be saved. Huh? If we run and we don't faint, hmm? Do you hear me? Somebody says, how do we find with the Lord what have you do? You don't find it. You surrender to him. Don't go looking for it. Don't do that. Surrender to him. Be genuine. Do you not, do you know that in your genuineness is the assignment? Do you know that? Is in your genuine, when you're being kind to someone and you're thinking about the Messiah, as you do everything you do, because in the Bible it says do everything as you would do, do unto others as you would do unto the Lord. Doesn't it say that? So when you're engaging with a person and you're mindful about the Messiah, right, your engagement is going to be a bit different. Be genuine in your engagement and you're going to find the assignment. You'll see it. You'll see it. Be genuine. You're calling. You don't make up a calling and do something that's not you. Be genuine, and you're going to find out that you were made for your calling, and your calling was made for you. You cannot separate the two. You cannot separate the two. You can't separate the two. Huh? You can't. There are things in our lives that give us hints of who we are. In your personality, your God-given personality, you're going to find pieces of your calling. That's why I never miss my calling. I have an answering machine. You don't have to miss it. Just be genuine. You don't have to emulate anybody else. Be genuine with who you are, with who God made you to be, and you'll find it. 
See, mine was so outrageous. You know what everybody told me? Huh? I didn't even tell anybody about my interest in knowing what my calling was. And I didn't I didn't communicate to anybody, but all of a sudden when I started thinking about my own calling, I didn't mention anything out loud. Do you know what happened? People started coming up to me in conversations that were hearing in conversations, and they would say, Oh man, you're never meant to do so and so. You're never meant to do this. And I've started hearing this thing over and over. I said, Lord, what is this? I didn't speak to these people about my Christianity. I didn't speak to these people about my belief, my calling, nothing. Why would they all of a sudden attack what I talk to you about only? Huh? The Lord said that's what they do. Many of you probably have noticed this and were discouraged, but let me tell you this. Those around you are not going to agree with your calling. They won't. They're going to, especially when they flip over in the flesh. If they're know-it-alls and things like that, they will not agree with your calling. Watcher says two or three witnesses. Well, your calling, your calling is different. Your calling is not something you're trying to confirm. In the Bible, it says when you confirm, you confirm something by two or three witnesses. But what is that something you're confirming? Something received of the Lord. That's what it gives us instruction on what should be confirmed with two or three witnesses. Your calling is different. That's between the Lord and you and nobody else. See, because what God called you for, you're going to be anointed for. And what you're anointed for, you're never going to get tired of. And the Lord will go with you and everything will try and stop you. And you will plow through it beyond your own belief. No one can stop what you're anointed for. Do you hear me? No one. No one. No one. No one. No one can stop what you're anointed for. Now, when you operate outside your anointing and take up somebody else's calling, okay, well, that's a different story. You may get tired, right? You may get tired. People are trying to find, they're trying to find their calling. And all they have to do is be genuine with the Messiah. You are made for the purpose in your life. Do you know that? Whatever color you are, your purpose to be that color. However you speak and sound, your purpose to speak and sound that way. Whatever you look like, your purpose to look like that. Because you draw specific individuals onto yourselves. People will listen to you, right? There are people who will hear your voice and hear that your voice is beautiful and think mine is ugly. When people are meant to hear you, they're not going to hear anybody else. You're highly purposed. See, the Bible says you're fearfully and wonderfully made. That means God didn't make a mistake. He designed you with intimacy. He didn't make a mistake. You are who you are. You guys remember my requirement of COT? Somebody said, well, what do you have to do to become a part of COT? What did I, what is my rule? Anybody know my personal rule? What is it? What is it? It starts out with be 100% what? You guys remember from the beginning, you guys remember, what is it? Be 100% yourself. Be 100% yourself. That's what you are to be. You're not to be anybody else. You're to be 100% yourself. When people try to emulate others, I can always see it. Because what people do not realize is how beautiful they are with who God made them to be. They don't realize that. They just don't realize that. Some people can't see it. They can't see it. God did not make a mistake. He didn't. That's why you can't be separated from your calling. You don't need a break from it. Is something that you naturally do. See, in the Bible, it says, whom he called, he also qualified. That means if you're qualified for the call, you've been trained for it, which means you lived a life specifically to train you in your calling. Just like in the Bible, when it says that blind man was born blind from birth, 
so he could be healed by Jesus when Jesus came. My goodness, that's powerful. Huh? That's powerful. Just like that sick, there are sick people out there sick. They didn't do anything, but their purpose to be sick for the sake of God's work. Huh? That's powerful. Some of you went through hardships in life. You have no idea what was departed to you, but I, I have an idea. I try to tell you guys about that all the time, especially those who have been sexually abused. Something has been departed to you, and you are a warrior. You don't even believe that, do you? If you've been sexually abused, you have a power to recognize that same demon that came after you. You can find it anywhere in the world. Do you know that? And it knows you can see it, and it will avoid you, but you have power to point it out. Nobody else can do that. See, a person can walk right past you. They can be under the power of that demonic entity. Nobody will know. Everybody just smiles. But if you've been sexually abused, you can see the telltale marks of that demonic entity. Hmm? How many of you who have been sexually abused... How many people have you passed up and you know they were touched by that same demonic entity you could see it in their eyes? You can look at a person and see where it dwells. That thing can't hide from you. You think that's an accident? You can do what hardly anybody in this world can do. You can identify who it's attacking. Do you know that's needed in the world? Why do you think we have so many of these these sex things going on in the news where people get snatched up, sold into sexual slavery. You have the power to identify what that spirit is and break the back of that entire operation. But you've got to agree to operate within your own anointing. God gave you each other. Half the people here at COT, half the people that hear my voice, do you know they've been sexually abused? or physically abused by their parents? Do you know I have a drawing upon my life for those who have been abused by their parents? Men who have been ignored by their fathers and beaten up by their fathers, do you know that? That's my anointing. For women who have been every single, just about every single female who is drawn to my voice has undergone some abuse. In most cases of a very harsh type. They hear something in my voice they can't identify. They're just drawn to it. They don't know what it is. And it's not, you know what, a lot of times, God will give you something, right? It's not for you to go out and date everybody. It's so that people will take time to hear you so that the Lord may speak through you. Do you know, without, without the Lord's anointing, nobody will listen to me there's something you hear i know what it is i don't point it out too much i know what it is it's the very element that was missed in the upbringing it never fails people who are drawn to me a lot of them a lot of these males a lot of you males out there your your dads were absent they were very violent and drunk or something like that that means you're fighting for your life that means at any moment you're ready to give in There's so many I knew about. I know your plight. I know what you're up against. I know that feeling of pressure from the outside. The Lord anoints a person for what they're called to do. See, I never meet a stranger. Nope. The Lord will show me exactly what I'm talking. Do what you do in truth. Mm-hmm. Be genuine. You'll discover that calling. You'll also discover that you and that calling are one and the same. That's what you'll discover. When God anoints you to go forward, nothing will make you go backward. Everything may come against you to fight you. But through Christ, you'll overcome it all. Don't let Satan talk you out of it now. These are the days of restoration. 
These are those days you were born to be in. This is that time you knew about in your youth. These are those moments. Be genuine all the way. All the way. And he's got you. The Lord's got you. Every step of the way. So be 100% yourselves. Because God did not make a mistake. And you have been armed with what hardly anybody can go back and get. You have oil that will cost somebody a high price. And that price is their life. Do you hear me? That's the kind of oil that you have. You cannot give anybody that oil. They have to go and purchase their own, and it will cost them a lifetime to get it. Do you hear me? Have an understanding of that. The Lord has armed you for warfare at this time to go forward. That means you can stand, and you can walk, and you can finish this race. You've been anointed to do so. All you have to do is stand up and go forward. Follow Christ all the way. That's it. It's that easy. It's that simple. You don't have to make it complicated. It's that simple. Folks, my goodness. God bless each of you. I'm going to see you guys tomorrow. And we will have a prayer before I hop into the study tomorrow. I'll turn on the mic. It'll come on early. Okay? Then I'll do it again, probably. We can certainly include that again. We can. All right, I see that. God bless you guys. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to put that in a very special place so that you can see it. God bless you guys. I'm going to talk to you guys tomorrow right here at the Council of Time. Hang in there. These are those days. You are direct witnesses of one of the greatest times in history. The world won't see it that way, but you will. God bless you all. I'll see you all next time right here at COT. God bless.